The fear of selling out also preyed on the mind of Pollock's friend and contemporary, Mark Rothko. In 1958, he was offered a lucrative commission in Manhattan's most talked about new skyscraper, Mies van der Rohe's Seagram building, specifically the Four Seasons restaurant. Over the course of a year, Rothko's initial excitement for the project gradually gave way to growing skepticism. And the turning point is said to have come when he actually turned up here to eat a meal. He came for lunch and he looked around at his fellow diners and saw that everyone in here was a banker, a businessman. Everyone in here represented lots and lots and lots of money. And he's said to have remarked, do I really want my work to be the amusement of people who pay $50 a plate? That wasn't, in the end, what Rothko decided his work was all about. He was determined to keep his art pure. These are some of his pictures, and pure seems the right word for them. They're made of pure colour, laid in translucent layers and fields, oil paint with the shimmering, fugitive qualities of watercolour. But I think they're also full of that old American love for the continent's vast, sublime nature. When I look at these paintings, I see sunsets over a dark horizon. I see seas and skies. Once you've got Rothko on your mind, you can find his spirit, or at least find yourself seeing with his abstracting eyes everywhere you go. Even on an airport travelator, in a departure lounge, or looking through an aeroplane window. Gazing at the heavens from 20,000 feet, you might almost be traveling through some vast three-dimensional version of a Rothko painting. In fact, I'm on my way to the most ambitious of his works, an entire secular chapel in Houston, Texas. It was the culmination of his lifelong desire to see his pictures exhibited in a series under controlled light conditions, and this is the result, the Rothko Chapel. The building's name suggests that what you're going to find when you come in here is um, some kind of religious space. But what kind of religious space? It's hard to say. He's clearly got the form of the altarpiece in his mind. There's one, two, three triptychs in here. And there's this question of where should you look? Because in, an, in a regular church or chapel, you, there's a principal point of orientation. You know, you'd look there at the main altarpiece. And yes, okay, here, that is the biggest picture. But there's, you do not have the sense that that is where you look for, for your enlightenment, for your clarity, for, you know, all the answers are going to be over there. No, here you've got this sense that well, maybe I should look there or there. There's, a, there's another triptych there. There's one here. So where do you look? It's, it's almost like a hall of mirrors. And okay, the pictures don't reflect you back, but in a sense they do because they're quite, they're quite resistant to the gaze. They're not as misty. They don't take you in as much as some of Rothko's earlier work. They seem to, to come back at you with their materiality. And Rothko said something or hinted I think to a friend that, that when he was thinking about creating these pictures, he was thinking about creating pictures that when you look at them, what you're actually looking at is yourself.
too. What do you see when you look at these paintings? You look into that glimmering void. Was that God or just a trick of the light? Are these pictures windows through which we can glimpse some sense of transcendence, some sense that there is something beyond? Or are they walls that bear down on you? That are, are they symbols of the fact that, that, that this life is all we've got and that there's no way out? I think the beauty of it is that, that Rothko leaves it perfectly, completely ambiguous. There are no answers in here, only questions.